Let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 41. We're going to look at Isaiah 41 and 42. Title of our study, Servants, Friends, Family. Servants, Friends, Family. Isaiah 1 through 39, that the major theme was on God's judgment. Isaiah 40 to 66, the major theme in a word, comfort. Now, there's judgment throughout and there's comfort throughout, but you can see a clear dividing line if you familiarize yourself with these uh, prophecies. Messianic prophecies abound, mentioned it last week. Uh, and, And there's another issue. There are some who are troubled by the difference in theme and tone and style And for some reason, they're like, well, this just seems different than the other part. And because men think they're smarter than they are, they came up with this idea that there were actually two different people who wrote Isaiah. I don't want to say two Isaiahs because I'm not sure that's the theory. But I do know it's a completely foolish idea. And here's why. Jesus quotes from the first section of Isaiah and attributes it to Isaiah. Jesus quotes from the second section of Isaiah and attributes it to Isaiah. I'm pretty sure we can trust Jesus on this issue. He said it, that's good enough for me. Same deal with Jonah. You know what they say. Well, how do we know Jonah really went through that? Jesus said, as the prophet Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He would never take a fabrication to illustrate the most important event in human history, his crucifixion that leads then to his resurrection three days later. So now we're looking beyond the terror of the Assyrian captivity. We looked at that in the last few weeks, uh, the destruction of the nations as they moved south and west, uh, the destruction of Israel there in the north, and we've looked, we're looking beyond God's protection of Judah. We saw that two weeks back as the Assyrian army surrounded the city of Jerusalem. He protects both Judah and Israel its capital, Jerusalem, wiping out 186,000 Assyrians in one night. Now, important to know, when he writes these things, they're yet future, but some of them, like the destruction of the 186,000, happened soon after. Now we fast forward 70 plus years because, well, actually much more than 70 plus years because after the Assyrians were wiped out, the Babylonians came to power. Sometime later, they come and surround the city of Jerusalem, only they completely devastate it. They knock down the walls. They destroy the temple. They take the people captive, Daniel and his friends among them. Many of you familiar with that whole scenario and story. So the 70-year captivity is yet well out at this point when Isaiah is writing because the Babylonians have not yet come to power at the time he's writing. That's one of the things that caused some to say, well, maybe he is not really Isaiah because not only do they hold that the temper and the tone is different, but some of them just don't believe in prophetic prophecy and that to the undoing of their own faith because we will read from this point in Isaiah till the end again and again and again, I am God and there is no other. There's none like me declaring the end from the beginning then causing it to come to pass. Who else can do that, God says? And even in our passage tonight, he'll challenge the idols, to tell us what's happened and what's going to happen and then have anything to do with it, knowing, of course, none of that is possible. Last thing I'll mention in the way of introduction, King Cyrus 
will be a major player in the destruction of Babylon. He's a Persian king. He takes on the, the, um, the uh, Medes and absorbs them. He takes on the Babylonians and sets his capital up there in Babylon. He was a major player, and we're going to find God is the one who raised him up. God's the one who used him. In fact, God names him long before he was ever formed in the womb or born, and he tells, well, he, he, he gives it to Isaiah so Isaiah can say, hey, you got to check this out, or whoever at that point is representing. Look, there's, there's this God in Israel. He named you and said, here's what you're going to do. Well, spoiler alert, that's next week. So anyway, uh, you can read ahead now or not. Well, chapter 41, verse 1, keep silence before me, O coastlands. Let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together for judgment, who raised up one from the east, who in righteousness called him to his feet, who gave the nations before him and made him rule over kings, who gave them as the dust to his sword, as driven stubble to his bow, who purposed them and passed safely by the way that he had not gone with his feet, who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning and in case we don't know, he says, I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. God's saying, who has brought about what's taken place so far? The Assyrians, God raised them up. The, per, the uh, Babylonians, God will raise them up. The, the uh, Persians, God will raise them up. Why? Why? Because God has been, is now, and will always be in control of what's taking place on planet Earth. That doesn't mean that all the people and the players and the politicians are puppets, though with the politicians, perhaps, though not necessarily God's puppets, just somebody's puppets. I saw a satirical piece. I can't remember which candidate it was. That might be for the best but it was uh, somebody who was super rich selling that candidate. He said he hasn't really lived up to expectations, so he's putting him on the market, and he can be bought for this amount. And I thought, what an irony, and yet, what? Not an irony. So uh, anyway, last time, uh, we focused on God as creator, and, uh, you know, our relationship to him, we are his creation. And of course, uh, tonight we're focusing on servants and friends and even the family of God. And when we get to the end of all of this, very important, we're going to prepare our hearts for communion, and I want you to consider those three words, servant, friend, family, servant, friend, family, because, because all of you should be all three. And it's possible to be none of those, although I don't know what you're doing here, but I'm not suspicious. I'd be excited for you thinking, okay, the, I do know what you're doing. The Lord's drawn you so you can hear the truth that can set you free, that can change your life that can move you to the place God wants you to be. Well, verse 5, we read, The coastland sought and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid. They drew near and came. Everyone helped his neighbor and said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. He who smooths with the hammer inspired him who strikes the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. Then he fastened it with pegs that it might not totter. Now, if you were here last week, you'll remember this same phrase because, well, these two chapters go together well, as will this and the next, because both of them focus in part on the idolatry of that generation and those that would follow and the foolishness of fashioning a god out of gold or silver or out of wood, and then having to make sure that you can 
find a way to secure it so it won't fall over. Well, there's more to consider, but I'm gonna keep pressing ahead so we have lots of time for communion. And uh, last week, only got through one chapter. That's the first time that's happened to me. And, uh, and I'm looking at these notes and saying, it might not be the last. So we press on. Well, some today are saying, just like they were, be of good courage. Everything's gonna be okay. Let's work on an idol together. And that's what they were doing. Some today are saying things are getting better. Do you hear that very much? Less and less, don't you? They were saying it though, but I think they're figuring it out out there that things are not getting better. Some are saying, don't worry, they'll get better when I'm elected. I believe that even less. Someday they'll cry out to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. But you, he says, in contrast to those idolaters, Israel are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, you whom I've taken from the ends of the earth and called from the furthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Servant, 508 times in scripture. My servant, 73 times God uses that phrase. He uses it of Abe, of Moses, of Caleb, of David, of Job, of Isaiah, of Jacob, of Israel. And listen, there is no higher calling than to be a servant of God. It's not about career because whatever God's fashion informed you to do, you should do and do it with all your heart and as unto him. It's about calling. Because whatever you do to make a living, your calling is to represent Jesus there among those people you serve, those people you oversee, those people you work alongside of. If you're still in school, same thing. The professors need to know, your fellow students need to know that you believe and that you believe in a God that made them and loves them and sent his son Jesus to die for them. Servants, huge issue. Friend, even better in some ways, 55 times in scripture. Why is it better to be a friend than a servant? Because a servant has to ask for something. A friend can just come on over, open your door, go and open the fridge and make a sandwich. You might still say, what are you doing? And they'd be like, oh, I'm making a sandwich. Sarcastically, I'm sure. The point is, friends have access in ways that servants don't. Now, better to be a servant of God than not, but better to be a friend of God and a servant of God. You know, Jesus tells his disciples, I call you friends. No longer do I call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing, but I've told you all things that I'm doing and my father's doing. But get this, when they write, they still call themselves servants, doulos of Jesus Christ, bond slaves of Jesus Christ. It's important. He called them friends. They were friends to him because he says, hey, if you wanna be a friend to me, do whatever I tell you. They were doing that but they still considered themselves servants. And we're told at one point, when you've done everything you were supposed to do, not like that happens that often, but if you had a day where you did everything you were supposed to do, consider yourself an unfaithful servant. So friend, Jesus, a friend of tax collectors and citizens. I mean, it's citizens, yeah, that too. One of those nights, I'm not even reading it, I am just memorized it and somehow I get citizens. But uh, tax collectors and sinners, and listen, most of us aren't tax collectors, we're taxpayers, but we love that. What, what, they call it contributions now, but if you don't contribute, you'll find out it wasn't. But uh, tax collectors and sinners, I'm so grateful that Jesus loves sinners 
because that got me in the door, you see. And, and, and it's like if he didn't love sinners and die for sinners, we would have been helplessly and hopelessly and eternally lost. Abraham, by the way, is called a friend of God. Not many in Scripture have that distinction. We are warned that the one who wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, he's not saying we shouldn't be lovers of people in the world or friends to people in the world. He's talking about the system that opposes him and blasphemes him and, uh, you know, substitutes darkness for light. He says, if you love the darkness, you are not going to be well, loving the light. You make yourself an enemy of the one who's pure light. If you love a lie, you cannot love the truth at the same time. And our Lord is the holy and, and, and righteous and true and living God. The way, the truth, and the life, the Holy Spirit, he sends the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. So uh, what else do I have for you? A, believe God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. That's the passage. It's James 2.23 for you note jotters. He was called the friend of God. Jesus in John 15.12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. And I love that. Greater love has no one than to lay down his life for his friends. So he reminds them, this is the kind of love I'm talking about not just doing something for others, but laying down your life for them. For him, that was absolutely literal, but he's saying in the same way, we need to love one another the way he's loved us. Then he says, you're my friends as if you do whatever I command you. I already mentioned this to you. I want to read it so I have it word for word. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from the Father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Don't misunderstand. He means first. He's not saying you have no choice. Of course you do. All day long, I've held out my hands to a stubborn and rebellious people, he says, of Israel, and you would not. He's always sincere in the offer. And uh, many reject the offer of, of pardon and forgiveness and life and all that he's purposed and planned. He says, I've chosen you and appointed you. We had a little accident out there. I was doing something else. Don't need to go into the gross details, but let's just say it was gross. And... Uh, but anyway, someone come and said, is it okay if I get a bucket and mop and help with this issue? And, and I'm like, tell her yes, tell her yes, because Bud was right there. Like, you never tell somebody no who wants to clean up vomit, and, which I'm not telling you that's what it was. But uh, why did I bring that up? Oh, here's why. We officially deputized her at that moment. Anytime she sees it, she's welcome to clean it up. And let me just say, true for any of you, you don't have to ask us. The bucket's in the hall. The hall's right there. The door's right there. Right? Well, you go out. Little door, bucket's in there. F mops, feel free uh, if you have a need. So, um, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. You know, the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the first. The very last thing he says is self-control. I love that. Starts with love, it ends with self-control. And in between, patience, kindness, goodness, you know, all those awesome things that describe the, the, the love that God's shown us and that we need to show one another because he said, love as I have loved you and your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father, he may give you. And just because he knows they had short attention spans and us too, these things I command you that you love one another. Fear not, we read in verse 10, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. Listen, true for them, true for us. Why aren't we to fear? He's with us. Why shouldn't we be dismayed? He is our God. He says, I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Comfort, hope, 
He's with us. He's for us. Fear not. 11 times in Scripture, six of them in Isaiah, three of them in this chapter, Isaiah 41. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing, and those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you shall be as nothing as a non-existent thing. Listen, true even of Satan, who we saw last time in our study of Revelation, will be in the pit, far ahead but coming, and then ultimately cast into outer darkness. For I, verse 13 the Lord your God will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, I will help you. Fear not, you worm Jacob. And I'm like, that seems strange, but we'll come back to it. You men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. It's like he's doing this beautiful, fear not, I'm with you, fear not, I care for you, fear not, I'll protect you. And then he says, fear not, you worm. I'm like, I, I'm like what? So, so it, it's a bit unexpected, at least it was for me, in a passage meant to encourage. But here's what happens. The word is tola. 43 times it's used in the Old Testament, and, uh, you know, I checked Strong's expository dictionary first. And, uh, you know, th th the interesting thing is, is I thought maybe it would soften it or lighten it. It was worse. It went from worm to maggot. So I, it's like, it's like the Lord's like, fear not, you maggot. And uh, I'm like, why, Lord? I mean, why call us maggots if you're trying to encourage us? But maybe it's because we are worms and we are maggots. And, and, and apart from him, we would remain worms and maggots. You know, we can think so highly of ourselves. Maybe it's good to get a picture of what he sees. Maybe he's seeing beyond the exterior. All the hard work, especially you ladies, because clearly you guys aren't working that hard getting ready. But the ladies work hard. So he's probably only talking to the guys here. You maggots. So anyway, <laughs> the word is used of our Lord. Shocker. Isaiah. Well, no, let me give it to you. Psalm 22, verse 6. Jesus. It's speaking of him. It's prophetic, messianically so. I am a worm, he says, and no man. A reproach of men and despised by the people crucified for us you know and I'm thinking if you haven't read Psalm 22 do it tonight later when it's quiet if you're married and you can you know find some time together in the midst of all the other things that happen especially if you have kids sit down together and read Psalm 22 because there are some things there that will just pierce your heart in the best of ways and encourage your heart in the best of ways. Well, in any case, whatever led him to say this to and through Isaiah, Isaiah 118 said this, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, same word translated worm and maggot. Why? because the type of worm or maggot we're talking about was crushed to make the dye that they used for some of the articles there in the, the temple, first in the, the tabernacle, later in the temple. It was a beautiful scarlet dye. But in that passage, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they are red like crimson. Same word, tola. They shall be as wool. However that all comes together for you, I'd spend some time dwelling on it, thinking about it, saying, Lord, open this up to me because there's more here. There's always more. But for us, verses 15 and 16, God promises them, and it's true for us, victory over 
all their enemies. And then, of course, their enemies were the Assyrians, and then it was the Babylonians, and then it was, you know, the, the Persians. Though the Persians dealt best with them of all those who actually dominated them. And so, behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains, beat them small, make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them. The wind shall carry them away and the whirlwind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. He's reminding them and reminding us God uses men. He uses women. He uses our children, but he deserves all the glory because the battle belongs to the Lord. The victory is his. Verses 17 through 20, a promise to do what he'd always done for them and what he's always done for us, that's to provide for them, just as he had their forefathers. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree, the myrtle and the olive tree. I will set in the desert the cypress tree, the pine, the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. Two things, their enemies were physical, tangible before their face. There was a spiritual, demonic aspect to it all, of course, because motivating their enemies to be as destructive as they were, well, that was all, you know, coming from that spirit that loves to steal, to kill, and destroy. The second thing is, there is one thing that we've seen and will see that God has never seen, and that's our equal. I see it every day. I see those people beyond me. God never finds an equal. He is so high above his creation. Nothing should be or can be compared to him, and yet... Men make and worship idols. That's why this is important. Verses 21 through 29, a courtroom scene. The idols of men are on trial. And he's saying to them, tell us what happened. Tell us how it happened. And tell us what's going to happen next. There in verse 21, still in Isaiah 41, present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or do evil. God's saying do something that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. I have raised up one from the north and he shall come. From the rising of the sun, he shall call on my name and he shall come against princes as through mortar, as the potter treads clay. Who has declared from the beginning that we may know and former times that we may say he is righteous. Here's another theme that will be reoccurring and developed in the coming chapters. Who's spoken and then made it happen? Who's done these things and is the righteous and true and living God? Surely there is none, no one who shows. Surely there is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who hears your words because they were idols, you see. No one could know what they thought because they didn't think. No one could know what they declared because they never spoke. They were made by men and they were worthless to those men. 
I looked and there was no man. I looked among them, there was no counselor who when I asked of them could answer a word. Indeed, they are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their molded images are wind and confusion. Now, chapter 42, we'll get through it rather quickly for two important reasons. I was doing three chapters a night, somehow up to this point. Then I did two, and I couldn't even do two. I just did one. Now I'm back on track, but that isn't even the goal. The goal is this moves us to our Lord. Behold my servant, chapter 42, 1. And we're going to be sharing in communion, important that we focus on him. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Some of you recognize these words because you've familiarized yourself with Matthew's gospel. They are quoted in Matthew 12, 18 through 21. They speak of Jesus, of his gentleness, of his compassion on the bruised, on the broken, on the burnt out. He's not going to break the bruised reed. He's not going to you know, put out the smoking flax. If he sees any sign of hope or life or faith, he's going to fan it into greater hope and more life and greater faith. There's something else. Have you ever heard it said, if you want something done, do it, or if you want something done right, do it yourself? Of course you've heard it. You've probably said it. And listen, God did exactly that. He wanted to be represented perfectly, so he came in the person of the Son who perfectly represented the Father. The exact representation, we're told, the the express image of the Father. Jesus is the greatest servant ever, perfectly representing the one who sent him. So thus says the Lord God, verse 5, who created the heavens, stretching them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. What's the difference between breath and spirit? Some say, well, not really much difference. No, God formed Adam from the the dust of the ground, the dirt of the ground, you remember, and he breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. Important. God breathes the physical life, the life that all men have. He made us and he gave us life physically. But when he speaks of the spirit, he's talking about life spiritually. And it's not true that all men have the spirit of God. And it's not true that all men are children of God because if anyone hath not the spirit of God, he is not his. Well, he goes on then to say, verse six, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Again, speaking of our Lord, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. You can see why I want to be in this passage as we look toward communion because we've gone from the idolaters and the idols they make and the worthlessness of them to the one who made all things and who came and lived among us and was a perfect representation of the Father to us and said, I I do always those things that please the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We don't have to wonder if the father loves us because his love was demonstrated in sending his son to die for us. Well, there's more. 
He promises to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Sight and freedom. If you continue in my word, Jesus says, you'll be my disciples. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And never tire of reminding us, myself and you, and anyone who'll listen, freedom is in God and in his word. Not in doing my thing and doing his thing. He set me free to be the man he created me to be, true for each of us here tonight. I am the Lord, verse 8. That is my name. My glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. He's saying, hey, I told you what was going to happen, and it's happened just as I said it would. Those people who tell you, man, revelation? That stuff's not going to happen. They were saying Israel wasn't going to be a nation again until 1948. And you know what they said after 1948? That's not actually Israel. No, that's some Zionist movement. They just happened to be back in the land. After being dispersed throughout all the world, do you know that's never happened in human history? But it's happened to them more than twice. They get taken away and they find their way home. They get blasted out and they're coming back. Why? Because God gave them the land forever, forever, forever. So they can be gone a thousand years and he's like, time to come home. They can be gone 70 years, time to come home. But he always brings them back and he's bringing them back in their fullness yet in the future. So behold the former things, those things I told you, They've come to pass. New things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. The latter, well, it's the proof he's truly God. He says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Then I'm going to make it happen. And if you read ahead from this point in Isaiah, again and again, he'll say it. I declare those things, then I make them come to pass. Who else can do that? So he says, he says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Here's our response, you see. If he's not your God, give your life to him. If he is, praise and preach him. Sing to the Lord a new song. Praise from the ends of the earth. And you who go down to the sea and all that's in you coastlands and you inhabitants of them, let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. I like this because he's mentioning prevailing and enemies and just last week or the week before or, well, somewhere in the very recent past, we mentioned it wasn't until after they shouted the walls of Jericho fell. It wasn't until after they shouted that Gideon's armies won that battle. And, and, and again, you know, we know the trumpets were involved. That's probably the context we were looking at it. But here we see it. Shout it out. Shout it out. Declare his name. Sing to his glory. Give glory. Declare him. He shall prevail against his enemies. Verse 14 reminds us God may delay judgment and often has. Why? To give time for repentance. But God's judgment always comes. That's a comfort to those waiting for the kingdom and it should bring some fear into the hearts of those not yet right with the Lord. I have held my peace, he says, a long time. Verse 14, I have been still and restrained myself. Now I will cry like a woman in labor. I will pant and gasp at once. Interesting because you know Jesus likened his judgment in the last days, those first things leading up into the tribulation to, to birth pangs. 
It's a similar image here. I will lay waste the mountains and hills, drying up their vegetation. I will make the rivers coastlands. I will dry up the pools. I will bring the blind by a way that did not know. I'll lead them in the paths they've not known. I will make darkness light for them, crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. They shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed who trust in carved images, who say to the molded images, you are our gods. And we talked last time, those who make them are like them. They, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have feet, but they can't walk. They have hands, but they can't handle. Those who make them are like them. Here he says, you deaf, look, you blind, that you may see. He's talking about those who won't listen to him, though he's spoken to them, that won't look to him, though he made them. Who's blind, but my servant, or deaf is my messenger whom I send. Who is blind as he who is perfect, and blind is the Lord's servant, seeing many things. But you do not observe opening the ears, but he does not hear. They deceive themselves into thinking, we have his law, that should be enough. But it wasn't about having the law, it was about obeying the law, or at least casting themselves on his mercy when they realized they hadn't. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes. They are hidden in prison houses. They are for prey and no one delivers, for plunder and no one says restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and hear for things to come? It sounds like something he'd be saying to us tonight as we prepare for communion. Who will listen? Who will pay attention? Who will consider the things to come who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to the robbers was it not the Lord he against whom we have sinned for they would not walk in his ways nor were they obedient to his law you see they had a history ancestors who walked with God yet they were rebellious and disobedient and doesn't that sound familiar we have a history, ancestors who walked with God. And yet, he has poured on him the fury, verse 25, of his anger, the strength of battle. He set him on fire all around and he didn't know it and it burned him and he did not take it to heart. Before we share in communion, before we pray together, consider your relationship to the Lord. I mentioned in the introduction, servants, friends, family, important to know you can be a servant used by God and not be a friend of God how do we know God calls Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon his servant he doesn't call Cyrus his servant but we'll see next week Cyrus certainly was serving the Lord so you could serve and never become a friend friends you can be a servant and you can be called a friend. Consider yourself a friend of God and still fail to become family. How do we know? Judas. Listen, all that he sent the others to do, he sent Judas to do. He sent them two by two. That means that ministry of, of healing and even casting out demons and, and proclaiming the good news. Judas participated he was a servant of God Jesus called him a friend friend are, are you betraying me with a kiss it's interesting Judas was no friend to Jesus but Jesus was still a friend to Judas and my point is this you could be a servant you could be a friend and still spend eternity separated from God because it's got to come down to family. You see, family, and some say, we're all children of God. We're all the family of God. God says you must be born again. Children of God, having been born again of his spirit, adopted in, loved and chosen, grafted into Jesus. The question many will ask is, can we be sure? How do I know that I know that I know that I'm truly a child of God? If we're not all children of God, how do I know I'm born again? 
How do I know I'm forgiven my sin? Listen to Paul, then to John, and then we pray and share in communion. Romans 8, 14, as many are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. You didn't receive the spirit of bondage to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Sons of God, adopted, born again, Abba, Father. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. So clearly not all his children. Beloved, now we are children of God. It's not yet been revealed what we shall be. We know when he's revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Lord, you created us to serve you. But more than that, to be intimate, to be friends, to be in fellowship, to enjoy you. And you created us, Lord, for more than that, to experience the new birth, to be adopted into the family of God, born again by the Spirit of God. Tonight, my prayer is that every person here is all three, a servant, a friend, and family. And if there be any of you, while the worship team returns and the ushers prepare to bring us the communion, who can't say with absolute assurance, I belong to Jesus, born again of his spirit, adopted into his family, washed clean by the blood he shed on Calvary's cross. If you're not sure that you're sure that you know that you know tonight, give your life to the Lord Jesus. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord, forgive my sin. I confess my need. I confess your holy, perfect, rightness, righteousness. I turn from my sin and I put my faith in you. If that's you and you've never done it, I'd ask you to raise your hand. If you've never given your life to him, before we take the bread and take the cup and, and worship again, anyone this evening, this hour, this service. You know us, Lord. You've drawn us. Now minister to us as we worship you again in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.